and it was when we were under the bridge, and I had a show there, and Robin came in, and our very, very, very first conversation was about morphogenic fields. <laughs> and it kind of just spun morphogenic, morphogenic fields. fields, and it kind of spun out, spiraled out from that point. Oh. Um, and we first came up with a proposal with a very different title, and then we decided we wanted to kind of sit on it to see how the world evolved with COVID and the current political, past current political climate at that time. And man, am I glad that we <laughs> held out just a little bit longer on that. Um, so anyways, um, we started to kind of build these threads of, through conversations, we would get together about once a week and sit on opposite front porches, opposite sides of a front porch, and have tea and talk about all sorts of things from morphogenic fields again to looking at photographs, aerial photographs, macro photography of nature, and all sorts of inspiring deliciousness that really filled our conversations and our hearts and inspired us both. And then we would go back to our independent studios and do work there. And it was those conversations and that imagery and talking about favorite artists that we shared that really helped to develop these common threads that spun through both of our work, even though we both wanted to honor our individual processes. And um, I think that's mainly you know, how we got together and built these threads. I started out very young as a visual artist and had two lovely parents that encouraged me to follow my heart and to invest in music and to utilize all sorts of different tools for connection. And my dad's a retired pipe fitter and my mom's a retired Jane of all trades. And so between the two of them, they kind of needled me in different directions and then eventually I came back around to art. Um, so art's always been a meditation for me, and I'm also an instructor where I teach art, and I teach meditation, and I'm a sound therapy practitioner, so sound is a big deal for me as well. Um, so if I could all ask you just to trust me just a little bit, mm -hmm. and close your eyes, and just take a nice full deep belly breath in. and let it go. And with your eyes closed, visualize a white blank wall. And on this white blank wall, you see little bits of shadow dancing across it. Maybe they're shadows of objects that you recognize. Maybe they're abstract and they reference other things. And just focus in on those shadows and transform that wall into a lovely large picture window and take a nice full breath into that window and let it go as you're ready. Now visualize a very flat Midwestern landscape where you look out and it just looks like Siberia. It's nighttime, the stars are starting to poke out of that deep, dark sky, and you can see lightning dancing across the landscape. Take a nice full breath in, and when you're ready to come back to the room, come on back in. Artwork for me has always been a source of meditation and a sad. Um, this particular show aligns with me both kind of bodies like home for me. There's a quote by Agnes Chu that I'd like to read for you, and it's called The Desire for Elsewhere. It's the name of the book that she wrote, where it's from. And I feel like this quote really sums up how I feel about this body of work, our connection, um, the work together, and the directions that we put in the themes of the show. When I was a child, a teacher once said that there existed 195 countries in the world. Astronom astronomers lay claim 
to there being eight planets in our solar system. Of the hundreds of solar systems that lie in our galaxy, of the billions of galaxies that exist in our single universe. On still nights, when sleep forgets to steal me away, I think about all the worlds that have yet to be discovered by astronomers. Vast, immense worlds that continue to remain hidden within each and every one of us. Vast, immense worlds that continue to escape the consciousness of others. For me, growing up with my grandparents, a connection and really learning about our family history was all done through and evolved through the art of storytelling. And so that's one of my particular loves. And the other interests that I have are nature, science, neuroscience, cultural practices, life processes from birth to death, as well as sociology. And because of those things, and because of my parents, and because of my creative side, I'm in my own head a lot. And so if you see me and I don't respond right away, it's probably because I've escaped into one of those worlds in there. And I build up a lot of worlds within that space. I crave opportunities to stare out windows, to feel vacant space, and to kind of move into other realms. So the title for the show really evolved out of our discussion on different realms of existence, different states of being. Growing up, my dad would wake me up in the middle of the night and if it was storming out, he would put on an album. We'd lay on the living room floor and just watch the lightning storm coordinate with the music. Often he would put on Mystic Moon's orchestra one stormy night, and other times he put on the Velvet Underground or the Stones. But it was a really magical time for me. Having the forest across the street, I always thought that it was this vast, forest land that was magical with marshes, and then when I went back to visit as an adult, it was like, eh, maybe it's a little different now. Um, and so there's also that within our world and how our age can kind of change our perspective on things. And I love the idea of becoming immersed in other worlds and allowing others to become immersed in other worlds. And I feel that artwork, writing, music, poetry, lyrics, for all these little windows that we can use to kind of escape um, kind of like quick sort of slides into another space. And I like the windows to serve as hints. And I see like my work being as little hints or little windows for people to get into. And only hints because it's important for me that you have more space than I have to be able to create your own realm when you look at the work. And within each of us, there are a lot of different realms, I think. Um, there are different states of existence. They can be emotive or physical. So our emotions can kind of interact and designate, take us out of the present moment. Our body has all sorts of physical responses that are utilized and activated out of our control as term means for survival. And Within um, times, we can have deep connection with others as well as times of disassociation from others. We can utilize breath work to escape to ecstatic states, and we can also use meditation to learn how to focus our mind and have more control and more understanding of how our mind works. So with the creative process for me as an act of meditation, um, it's always helped me engage in new worlds and it served as a sad for me since a very young age. In the past, I struggled with a lot of different levels of trauma and music and art has always helped me return. It's always created opportunities for me to um, transform those experiences into powerful gateways. I now view life as a capsule of experience where how we respond and the connections that we make with other people are the neurons and neural pathways that form up the fabric of our being. And with that fabric, we can create sculpture, we can create paintings, and we can do a bevy of different things to sculpt what that lifetime looks like. 
So when I'm in my studio, art is more like a laboratory process for me. I like to collect materials and kind of have them all kind of chaotically out in front of me. And then it's sort of like mad scientist, what is this gonna do if I stick this with this? Um, so without, with this work, I kind of lost myself within the velvet and moss. And then I found myself again through wood and uh, acrylic and color pencil. I hesitated to start with the velvet paintings, mainly because of the connotation and the history of velvet paintings. So like Elvis <laughs> on velvet, the dogs playing poker, <laughs> were all different components that I was like fighting against. And it was really hard for me to want to bring these to the gallery because I just kept saying, no, no, it's velvet, but it's velvet. <laughs> and then I put the paint on the surface and I said, but it's velvet. <laughs> and I kind of really fell in love with the way that the paint reacted to the surface on these. So as I work, I tend to work on, if I'm working on a drawing or a painting, I'll work on a few at a time, or I kind of go back and forth to one or the other. And then if it's sculpture, I'll work on developing components. So for example, the clay sculptures two years ago, I started working on the clay components and I kind of built up a collection of just clay. Um, and with the clay components, I would experiment with mark making, with form and with shapes, just to see what I loved. And I had like a whole sorting process of these were denied, and these can go through the next gate. <laughs> and then about six months ago, I started taking those clay components and building up um, larger assemblages with them. So there's this process of collecting information that I really love. I used to work at a bookstore, and we would always find ephemera inside of books, and I always just felt like it was like this magical message from the past that was like tucked in for someone else to find after they dropped off this load of books. Um, and there's something just really neat about the art of collecting and what we choose, and I'm sure there can be books written or there are books written about the psychology of selection. So the materials that I played with were foamer, polymer clay, collage, assemblage, embroidery, um, wiring, found objects, and sound. The sculptures that are by the windows, I refer to those as being beacons. Um, beacons in the sense that they're my guide home. They serve as elders or the fire that you sit around and tell stories, or even the storytellers themselves. And it's just a way to get back to that center point. And so we have the beacon of sentiment which nostalgia for me has always been a great way to time travel and to go back to particular moments in my life where I can relive experiences that I'm really fond of. The beacon of nature. Whenever I go out into nature, I feel like that's when I can really just let go and just leave my body and just exist for a while, um, which doesn't happen enough, um, but it should happen more. Um, and that's a particular time, and nature for me is a particular calling that I think kind of helps us hit the reset button. And then there's the beacon of reason. And for me, my brain is very into problem solving. If I don't have a problem to solve, I will find one. Um, and it's almost like OC, kind of to like an OCD level. And so I reflect inward a lot, and I use a lot of like self-questioning to and self-dialogue to kind of figure out where I need growth to occur. The sound nests that are over here with the glass and wood and faux fur. Um, I'm also supposed to say with regards to the faux fur that no stuffed animals were hurt in the making of this pieces. <laughs> Um, they're Aries or Saturnists, and they're really meant to be kind of this really intimate connection between one and another. And so it's where one can sit in and return to oneself 
to have a really silent and kind of quiet moment with oneself to just reconnect and hear some lovely sounds. They actually do make sound. You can turn the bark on the top and each one has its own kind of chime, different tone based on. And so we've got the heart of Rome, which is the more caramel colored one in the back. And we have the heart of flora, which is to the left, the green, as well as the heart of water. And for me, those are the three components that communities really need and relationships really need to build up and to have strength. And so you have that fertilization, that rich soil, you have the water that has nutrients and it's clean and it's clear. And then you also have the plant life that comes from the combination of the two. This is a quote from Israel I. York that I really love. It's not the viability and the variety of the seed that makes the harvest look clumpy. Sometimes the soil must value the seed, and when the soil is not, a, not supportive, the seed becomes a waste. The dendron cords are the fountain sculpture pieces, which is bark and piano hammers and clay. And this is one here, and then if you go on the website, there's two others. This one is called Your Furrows Run Deep. And the sound that these make are very similar to a drum or a heartbeat. And for me, these are very kind of connected to my heart. In 5500 BC um, was when the first dated man-made drums um, were found. And they were made from alligator skin. I absolutely love and in love with alligators. Um, the bark has the texture that's akin to alligator skin, but it's a little safer to touch than the alligator itself. And when I think of trees, I go back to that first conversation that we had about morphogenic fields. And morphogenic fields are these invisible fields of energy that we use to communicate with one another. It's when you walk in a room and you can feel like something's off. It's how sleepwalkers can walk through an unfamiliar house at night and not bang into furniture because they can feel those energy fields press in from their body. There's also mycelium that are those tiny little hair-like frays that grow off mushrooms beneath the ground and trees use those to communicate. So the trees use those to communicate to the level of if one tree becomes diseased, they will cut off communication with that tree and learn how to self-isolate because of the mycelium that grows around them. This is a quote by Rilke. These trees are magnificent, but even more magnificent is the sublime and moving space between them, as though their growth too increased. Once the realization is accepted that even between the closest human beings, infinite distances continue to exist. A wonderful living side by side can grow up if they succeed in loving the distance between them, which makes it possible for each to see the other whole against the sky. And then just a couple more pieces. Um, these embroidered assemblages were really more of a deep meditation for me and an experiment of playing with traditional craft. Um, I grew up watching my grandmother embroider and do practice different knots. And um, I think keeping different crafts alive is really important. But it was also a way for me to look at how different um, practices that I enjoy could go together. For example, drawing and embroidery and assemblage or collage. And this is really where I pulled out a lot of the ephemera that I would find in books. There are postcards from the early 1900s and newspaper clippings from the late 1800s in some of these. Um, the handwriting in the postcards I just fall in love with every time I see it because it's so like, precise but rhythmic when you look at it as well as just uh, impeccable. 
The piece that I really is kind of my favorite of these is the one of the woman in front of the horizon. And that's entitled Ruby, Architect of Shadows. And most people that know me know that I have a deep, deep, deep affinity of shadows. I love the way that they appear. And I will walk around town and just take photos of shadows. Um, that all started when I was young. And my grandmother, Ruby, I would go and I would spend the night at her house. And she had this beautiful old hurricane lamp against a blank wall. And she would turn the lamp on. And then she would tell me stories about family history. And she would do shadow puppets with the hurricane lamp to illustrate her stories. And it was through her art of storytelling that I feel offered me a different way to really look at the world and to be okay with delving into my own shadows and exploring them and experimenting and figuring out what, you know, what's working here and what's not to embrace them. And then just another thing with the paintings on velvet, um, I'll talk about this one here, which is entitled Over Time, the Construct Fell Apart into awakening. And then there's one on the back wall that's closest to the brick for the window. And that one's called We Make Sense Once of the Soothing Chaos. So these paintings across the board just offer me time to really just process the world around me, but to go a little bit deeper within. And this year, more than any year, I've been kind of questioning my anxiety that I have with things not going as planned. Um, <laughs> I really like things to be orderly and for things to happen, like I'm going to do this at this time and this at this time, and that's all that's going to happen within that space. But then there's often something else comes in and it's like, ah. Um, and so I started questioning, like, you know, what is so frightening or terrifying about things changing or life coming in or when things become chaotic? and. I realized it was because I had lost touch with it. Um, it's not me. It's so, so much as the conditioning, I think, that we all go through where we become comfortable with systems. We have heartbeats that beat at a very specific increment and in regularity, so we align easily with things that are systematic. But also, we have also kind of let go a little bit with the systems that are in place. Um, with just allowing life to come in and to be carried away with it. So this particular quote by Terence McKenna um, is one of my favorites. Chaos is what we have lost touch with. This is why it's given a bad name. It is feared by the dominant archetype of our world, which is ego, which clenches because its existence is defined in terms of control. And this one kind of describes the current state of my studio, um, <laughs> which I wish more was born out of this, but it's by Mary Shelley. And its invention, it must humbly be admitted, does not consist in creating out of a void, but out of chaos. And then finally, the moss and the wood sculptures. Those were like really, I talked about them a little bit already, but they were really an intense piece for me. I was really able to deeply escape into my imagination with those. They were full of play, but they were also an exercise in practicing letting go, or practicing letting life come in. Because the moss, as well as the air plants, kind of have a life of their own, and they're just going to do what they're going to do after a certain point. And so it's kind of like you make these pieces and then you put them out in the world and you just let life happen to them. Um, and so this quote by Emerson, to be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. In this quote by Dan Lewski, and where there is no echo, there is no description of space or love, there is only silence. Those two particular quotes for me really resonate very strongly because I would just like for all of us to be in a world where we can be ourselves. And so each individual body of work and each individual piece for me is a different realm, a different place to be. It's a different window to 
move out and into. And it's also a different offering, honoring the motive of our connection, too. So thank you. My name is Robin Peterson, and um, as Stephanie mentioned, um, we met um, at a show that she had uh, in um, Abby's other uh, venue that was under the bridge. And although she mentioned that um, a lot of times her mind is off in these other, these other spaces, um, the very first thing that I noticed about her when, when I walked up and, and met was she has this incredible presence. I mean, she's like right there with you, and she's like unpretentious, and, um, and there's this clarity about her, about her being. And um, um, we just immediately connected, and um, so um, uh, about a year or so later, I had a show at the MAC in uh, Manitou Springs, and uh, she came and we talked and she asked if we uh, could do a show together, and I was really, really honored with the possibility of doing that. But the other interesting thing was, uh, I, we ended up, we lived a half a block from each other and we didn't know each other <laughs> at all. Um, so it made it really easier for us to be able to like start to get to know one another. And especially when we decided that we were gonna do this uh, show together, um, when we, the first theme that we initially picked was barrier land. And the reason we picked that was because we were really acutely aware of where we are, not just in this country, but in the world right now. I mean, literally every system is just disintegrating like crazy. And um, we started to think about how all life forms that have been on this planet in particular, they've, they've gone through some kind of barrier land as far as evolution is concerned. Um, you can see it in the fossil record where certain species only went to a certain place and, and that was it for their, for their um, part in the evolution of the planet. And then we started to talk about um, uh, different, different societies that have come and gone, different cultures. And um, when we when we were trying to figure out how we would express that, we really came to realize that we couldn't. We are as much in the dark about which direction things are gonna go. There is no specific compass. There's no line on the horizon right now. So we decided that in terms of the thing that we would come up with, we were just gonna have to sit and be in the barrier lens together. And um, so over a period of time, we met for a number of these really deep conversations that she uh, mentioned. And it was like sitting down and having a meal together on an intellectual and spiritual and um, an aesthetic level. Each of us was spooning these different ingredients that we talked about. Balinese shadow puppets. We talked about different forms of music. And um, so even though our styles are completely different, they do all connect to this particular theme. And even though my style and the, the forms that I have in my pieces are completely different, her, her being and things that she shared with me, they're in there. It's like when you do have a meal with somebody, when they made it for you, like say you have an Italian meal, well you don't become Italian after you eat that meal. But those ingredients, those spices, those things, they come in, they come into your being and they molecularly become a part of your being. So, um, um, when the kind of 
muse that I have, and this is going to sound very antiquated in this time period. Um, my muse is, um, I do experience it as like some kind of a form of the twin intelligence uh, for me. And um, I never ever um, do any preliminary work on any piece that I do, no matter what, what it is. Um, I do work with collage, and so I've collected like tens of thousands, maybe by this time hundreds of thousands of fragments of things, uh, whether it's um, pieces of old uh, material that I found in a junk shop, or um, they may be like eyes that I've cut out of pictures in a fa fashion magazine, or uh, it could be anything. And um, when I end up starting a piece, it's like, it start, it could start with something this small, and I don't know where it's going to go and what it's going to look like. But I've learned I just have to completely trust um, this particular um, kind of guiding part of myself that's not part of my, my, my particular personality or my own personal choices in certain ways. And um, anyway, so each one of these pieces that you see that are mine, they're, they're um, figure, figurative. And um, they relate to this particular theme because in so many of the cultures that have come before us, there were beings that provided specific functions in these communities, and they really were technicians uh, of the sacred. They did an interface between the community. And so um, when they would put on their specific costumes and take ritual objects, their consciousness would change and they would be that bridge uh, between the two worlds. And, um, and there was a particular symbology that was reflected in those different costumes. Now, our society, contemporary society now, has basically stripped most of that to the bone completely. Um, we've lost a huge sense of the sacred. And so I kind of feel like what my muse is trying to do is, it's, um, it's trying to remind people of kind of where we come in time and um, um, who we've been in different forms, um, our different belief systems, our different mythologies, and our, certainly our different relationship to, to the environment, to nature. Um, we've gotten so many incredible miracles through science and technology, but there's a part of ourselves that we've like really lost and before we were like really dependent on um, like um, formal religions to be able to um, um, structure that that sense of the sacred and whatever, we moved outside of that almost completely. But there's a big gap that's there that that um, we haven't been able to fill. So these particular pieces for me are like, in a sense, other ones that uh, I've continued to, to do. And like um, when Greg was talking in the other room, he mentioned he liked to work really large. I really do too, and I have uh, four feet by five feet, six feet by eight feet. And um, uh, I tried this time to see how these particular images look whether what kind of impact they would have with people if I worked in a smaller format. The other thing is, I started working with elements that I have not worked with before. Um, started to work more with a sculpture effect uh, on a number of pieces than just um, flat collaging uh, of things. Like this particular face, this particular figure here, 
That, that piece took me seven months. And it's actually composed of like between 900 and 1,000 tiny little pieces. And the reason um, that there were that many pieces is because, again, I don't know what I'm making at all. And so um, how, to, how far the features were supposed to come up off of that, uh, I couldn't use some kind of substructure to put it on there because I didn't know what it was supposed to be. So everything had to be cut up in little pieces and glued on and glued on and glued on until it came up and then it was like, oh, that's what you were supposed to be. Um, on pieces, some of the pieces that you can't see, which are directly around the corner here, um, there were uh, geometrics that were uh, behind the figures themselves. And um, those are pretty new for me, same way as the back here in the middle of those three small pieces. You can see the geometric forms that are in there, and that at the end is a new, a new um, uh, kind of a feature for me. Uh, I wanted to work with other materials a lot uh, when we were initially going to work on this project, and um, but some of them involve like um, aerosol, aerosols, and things, um, and. I don't have some place where I don't have a dedicated studio like that, so I, I went out a place with ventilation, I couldn't use those. So again, I kind of had to like uh, let go of the steering wheel and just um, agree that I would let the muse help me choose to go to the right materials. Um, I, out of this process uh, of working with staff, um, it was the first time I'd ever collaborated with someone else on a show that was a themed show. I'd been in other shows where, like, uh, Abby's had um, a yearly show where it's gratitude and people contributed their pieces of work. But this is the first time for me that um, I've actually done a show to show with someone we, we worked with a particular theme. And, um, Yesterday, when I was trying to think about how I kind of explain what that was experience was like for me, uh, this metaphor kind of came to me, and I thought about how it was like um, uh, building a bridge across an abyss. And um, on one side, there's a person who has their materials, and on the other side, there's another person with their materials, and this theme acts like this point out in, in space that you're both going to move towards there and connect. And um, um, there's, there's like this trust element that's so involved that like each of us has, our, our muse is like a, an architect in a, in a way. And, uh, an inner architect and um, and uh, has its own design sense and chooses its own materials and um, it, there's a, a crew inside of craftsmen and and um, artisans and laborers and so um, w uh, when we started out on this it was like okay we're waving over to the other side and, and um, Give it a go ahead, and um, and we start moving towards that point. And um, the idea of when those things meet was that so that when people would come to this show, they'd be able to kind of walk across that bridge of this theme, and they'd be able to see what's on the other side. What you know. And that the, the, uh, the style that the architecture came up with is with it, uh, her own beauty and his own beauty, that somehow um, that the respect that we have for each other um, would allow both of those to be what they were in order to like make that particular connection. Um, so the other thing I wanted to mention uh, very quickly is 
Um, my my artist journey, journey um, was kind of uh, very different from from Steph's. When I was younger, um, um, I was pretty good, really pretty good at drawing, and um, you know there used to be back back when there used to be these um, things that were on a, a, a matchbook that said draw this pirate you know and um send this thing in and um i'll give you an appraisal of what you, you what your you know, your, your skill is or whatever and um so um i'm this little kid and i i would do this drawing and my mom sent it in one time and and when it came back they were just very encouraging but um there was also there was this tv show on Saturday mornings called John Nagy's Learn to Draw and there was this guy and he had a goatee beard and he had a flannel shirt on and he would um, take chalk and he would draw and he was like the first artist that I ever saw. I mean he, he was so different. He was really bohem and so that was kind of appealing to me too. But anyway, I, I started to sit up every get up really early in front of the TV by myself and would draw draw along. And so um, one day when I was at school, the, the nun who was teaching teaching um, everything would at a certain point she'd go, okay, we're gonna have art now. And she would like go up to the chalkboard and try and draw something and I um, um, and, and we would draw along and she after a period of time she came over and said, um, why don't you draw on the board and, and try and teach some stuff? So I started to do that. Well, I get, you know, uh, uh, so far on a piece every day with people, and every single day she would have somebody come in, one of the students, and erase off everything on the chalkboard. So every time I came back in, I had to rush to try and, and draw, the, draw it all back up. Well, anyway, um, I I was really identifying with with that in, in being an artist. And then one day, um, I happened to be get get sick and was gone for a week. And when I came back, and um, we were having a class when I uh, um, she was going to have art period, I went to get up and she came over to me and she says, "No, you don't you don't need to do that anymore." Uh, we have this new kid, Fred Finley, and he's he's going to teach me. And um, so I'm probably seven-ish, eight-ish, and um, there was something about when that happened, uh, just happening out of the middle of nowhere, and it was such a shock that I lost my ability to draw. Mm -hmm. And um, for for um, probably until my 30s, I could not do any artwork. Um, I was lucky during that time because I ended up working in a record shop and music became just like one of the most important things in my life. But um, it wasn't until like I was in college and I was in, living in San Francisco and I went downtown one day and I was standing at a street corner waiting for the light to change and I heard this like intuitive voice that said, look down. And I looked down in the gutter, there was a part of a magazine, a picture of a face that was kind of torn out, and it said, put this in your pocket. And I didn't know why, but I put it in my pocket, and when I took it home, I just kind of put it on a, on a shelf. And over a period of, of weeks, every time I was out of somewhere, my being was like scanning and I started like collecting a lot of stuff and funny I put it in a shoebox and put it in a, in a, in a closet and I, um, I didn't know what it was for and then one night the same kind of thing happened this intuitive voice said get the box out and I um, put it on the table and started taking things out and looking at them and started to arrange them and um, my, my roommate at the time came over and looked at it and said, oh, that's collage. Mm -hmm. I didn't know 
what she was talking about exactly. But anyway, she kind of said, well, you got to get some Google and a board and stuff. And, and as soon as I started to do that, that's when this connection to being able to create, create art started to happen again after all this time. And um, that, that muse, that, that particular spiritual presence, for me anyway, that's the way I would describe it. Um, it's been my companion since then, and it's shown me and it's guided me to, to create all the different pieces. And um, I don't, I never question the content at all. Um, I just consider it just, um, I'm doing my part with my body and focusing my mind, and I just am letting it come out of a black hole, because that's what it's like, piece by piece, out of a black hole every time. And I consider my the images are universal images. Um, like the totem that's back there, um, that's not specific to any particular tribal group at all. It has characteristics from different ones. Um, these, any of these dancers that are here, um, and the dancers, there's like uh, three different dancers in, in this. I've never, I've never had dancers in mine before. They have, um, a number of them have eyes and certain parts of the body, and those reflect the consciousness that different sacred dancers in different cultures, when they would perform, they are channeling that particular form of consciousness that was essential to the mythology of, of their own particular culture. Um, the back in the on the far left of those three is one called the boogeyman and it's like a reflection of an archetype of an energy everybody has some form of a boogeyman inside themselves and um uh, it's a part of something that we have to dance with at different points in our life when we have to confront certain certain challenges in our lives. Um, and then the one that's on the right there, the Green Man Felici one, that's uh, a combination of an insectoid, humanoid, um, it, again, it's a, a kind of a hybrid in consciousness where um, uh, humans' relationships to the animal kingdom um, was personified in, in, uh, through um, um, uh, their their creation of masks and at and performing. So, um, kind of just to, to conclude here, um, um, when again when Stephanie and I decided to to do this, um, she has just been the most extraordinary person that I could possibly have been able to, to team up with. Uh, her knowledge of, of art and her, her sound work, which um, I hope sometime you'll be able to like do some form of demonstration like that, is, is like the perfect counterpart to what her visual art skills are. Um, anyway, and I, I want to thank Abby again um, it was about a year and a half or two years ago that we did our submission and because um, of what was happening with COVID, we, we got bumped and um, I'm so glad that we got bumped because, um, again, because of everything that was happening, we were both kind of waiting to, to see what the next direction would be and it was out of that kind of that gap that that um, this particular show was able to come out. So Abby's patience and wisdom in terms of talking was awesome. So, thanks. I also want to say thank you to Abby and just recognize um, that you Territorial genius that pops out, and she is a master at looking at work and puzzling it together. And 
It's just beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Appreciate you guys. Appreciate you. Thank you.